There it is. Welcome to The Reset. I am your host, Andre Clay. And on tonight's episode, Resetting Our Reality, Black Economics, Black Business, Black Wealth, an in-depth discussion with Dr. Umar Johnson. Again, Resetting Our Reality, Black Economics, Black Business, Black Wealth, an in-depth discussion with Dr. Umar Johnson. Those tuning in tonight, we are streaming live on Facebook and on YouTube. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. The comment section will be open tonight for those of you who would like to chime in. And with that, let us begin. Now, tonight's special guest needs no introduction for those of us who are familiar with his work. He is a leader in the Pan-Africanist movement. He is a political scientist, certified school psychologist, scholar, author, and orator. Family. Please join me in welcoming to the reset the Prince of pa Pan Africanism, King Kong of Conscious of the Conscious Community, and Big Brother, where is Grandma's Jesus money himself? Dr. <laughs> Umar Johnson. Let me get Peace and Pan Africanism. Right. Glad to be with you, my brother. Peace and all love right, to the entire right. New Orleans family. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How you, how you doing tonight, my man? I'm doing well, doing well. Peace and love to the entire New Orleans family. Uh, looking yes, forward to uh, seeing everybody next Saturday uh, for Sister Deshantia's business launch, Dimensions Consulting Firm. Love to see a new black business and love Absolutely. to see a new black woman's business. So I'm Absolutely. looking forward to coming and celebrating that with her and the entire New Orleans community next Saturday, Absolutely. March 23rd. Absolutely. Yeah, I would be remiss as well if I did not mention uh, Deshanta's uh, business um, endeavors, um, Dimensions Consulting Firm. Um, where she um, assists different businesses and specifically black businesses. You know, she explained to me in um, business alignment, business planning and um, grant funding strategies. Um, yes, also, yeah. Also tonight, um, the, uh, the second young lady to help make this possible tonight, um, my girl, Miss Monica Mocha Mer Merriweather of Mocha Radio down in El Paso, Texas. Mocha, oh. she specializes. Yeah, she specializes in our website development, Dr. Johnson podcast production, consultation, online marketing, and business development. That's oh, what she cool. does. Yeah, I've been working with her for a lot of years, and so yeah, again, I'm I'm so honored to have you here. And uh, again, I want to thank two the two young ladies uh, for making this uh this whole night possible for us. <laughs> uh, with that being said, Dr. Umar Johnson. I have been a fan of yours for many, many years, <laughs> many years. And I want to tell you, man, the first time I, I saw you, I remember seeing you on this clip. And, uh, and as I refer referenced before in your introduction uh, about Grandma's Jesus money, and if you don't mind, you know, let me, let me play that clip because <laughs> I, yeah. I, I got a hold of it. Hold on a second. Yeah, I remember this. Chicken wings for that money, even though they was no good. But you do get something for your money. But when you put your money in the church bucket, what do you get back? Hope in a future after you die. And my position on that, if I have to die to experience heaven, I don't need that religion. Mm. Anyone who tells me that I should be content with accepting hell on earth, when the white man has his heaven here, and the Chinese man has his heaven here, and the Arab and East Indian has his heaven here, and they're even building their heaven in my ghetto? And you're telling me I got to die in order to experience what they are getting right now? 
that's a religion I don't need mm. because that's a religion for servitude. And so we have to put the black church to task and ask them, what are you doing without Jesus money? Let me tell you what they're doing with your Jesus money. Every black church in America has their money in a white bank. It is the white banks that are funding the regentrification ethnic cleansing movement. So all of us go to church. We put three million dollars in the church coffers every Sunday. Three million dollars goes to a white bank every Sunday. And guess what they do on Monday? They take three million of black people's white Jesus money and they give loans to white land developers and businesses and entrepreneurs to come into the ghetto where the church is located, buy up all the property and force grandma out on the street homeless. Now grandma been going to that church for 30 years. Grandma been giving that church $50 every Sunday. And lo and behold, grandma had to finally face the reality that it was your Jesus money that put your ass on the street. Mm. Yeah, there it is. Grandma's Jesus Chicago, money. That Illinois, right there. I still remember that. We was in one oh. of the abandoned homes, one of the results of gentrification there. Yeah. Um, where we filmed that. Shout out to my Chicago, Illinois family. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's my hometown. Grew up on the south side myself, man. Uh, uh, yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Uh, you know, for those of you who may not <laughs> be familiar with Dr. Umar Johnson, if you will, sir, would you please um, share with the audience who is Dr. Umar Johnson and what are some of the current endeavors you are working on today? Yes, indeed. Dr. Umar Ifatunde is a certified school psychologist, doctor of clinical psychology. I'm an author of two books, Black Parent Advocate, The Art of War for Dealing with America's Public and Charter Schools. I do plan to have a few copies of that book on hand for Sister Deshanti's Black Business Launch on March the 23rd. Looking forward to that. And my first book, uh, Psychoacademic Holocaust, The Special Education and ADHD Wars Against Black Boys. I'm founder of the National Independent Black Parent Association, a movement created to help organize black parents to fight against racism in public and charter school education in the key areas of discipline, finance, social support, homeschooling, parent advocacy, special ed, and school policy. Currently right now, we're renovating the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey RBG International Leadership Academy in Wilmington, Delaware. We're actually planning a paint day next okay. month. So if anybody yeah. listening has been a donor to the school and would like to come and help us paint, we're looking at the second weekend in April, all okay. day Saturday, all day Sunday, we're gonna be painting the inside of the Marcus Garvey Elementary School. And once the all painting right. is done, we just have some floors and we ready for our inspection. So we ready to cross the finish line on the school. And so that's my biggest project, you know, right there. And of course I've made my name you know, by helping parents as a school psychologist, helping parents uh, fight to protect and rescue their children from the special education to medication to incarceration pipeline. Absolutely. Absolutely. Powerful, powerful. You know, I've been watching you for years and uh, I must say uh, you have remained consistent, very consistent in stressing the importance of black economics. And uh, with tonight's show, that's that's what I want to talk about yes, sir. tonight. Um, I want to start with uh, my first question. Very basic. In your own words, Dr. Umar, would you please explain to the viewing audience what is Black economics and how can we use it to advance our wealth position in the United States? Great question. What is black economics and how can we use it to advance our wealth position in the United States? You know, when anytime we talk about black business and black finance and black economics, there's two things that we have to bring into the equation. One is identity and the other is loyalty. Uh, without those two things, we never get to where we want to be. The reason why the black dollar is the easiest dollar to rape in this country, it's the easiest dollar to rob in this country. It's the easiest dollar to exploit in this country. And the reason for that is black people do not have a loyalty to black businesses above and beyond the businesses of other communities. Every other people have a loyalty to the businesses of their own race, of their own culture, of their own 
uh, ethnicity. Uh, the Chinese dollar is loyal to Chinese people above and beyond anybody else. Yeah. The East Indians dollar, the Arabs dollar, the Anglo-Saxon, yeah. the Jew, you know, the Latino, their dollars are loyal to their community. The black dollar is not. The black dollar has absolutely no loyalty at all to black people. So we have to deal with the issue of loyalty and we have to deal with the issue of identity because your identity okay. tends to dictate your loyalty. And so okay. a lot of us as American Africans, you know, we identify as American first. A lot yeah. of us, we don't identify as black first, which is ironic because no other people in America identify as American first. You know, yeah. they may love to be American, but they will let you know, I'm an Italian, I'm Irish, yeah. I'm right. Greek, I'm Japanese, Correct. you know, I'm East right. Indian. You yeah. know, the American piece is all fine and well, but they identify with that with that first name, that yeah. hyphen that comes before yeah. American. Even when you look at the behavior in the Olympics, a lot of, you know, uh, ethnic Europeans, who do they play for in the Olympics? Their yeah. native land. Most yeah. of them do not represent the United States in the Olympics. They represent their native land. So their identity and their pride within that identity dictates their economic loyalty. So what I'm saying is if we want to transform the dysfunctional economic behavior of American people, of American Negroes, we're going to have to reconstruct African consciousness and we're going to have to resurrect a loyalty and a pride in African people. Because simply put, we shop to feel better about ourselves and we, we shop we to self-medicate due, the, due to the oppression that we face here in the United States of America. We know that. But yeah. now what we have to do is add a cultural element into the shopping that says, if I'm going to spend this money, I at least need to make it a prerogative to spend as much of this money with people of my own community. In other words, mm -hmm. black people don't feel bad when they don't spend money with black people. Yeah, that's true. Black people do not feel bad. We can go shopping and spend $5,000, not a penny of it with a black person. It won't even cross our mind. And there's two That's reasons true. for that. Number one, we have been Americanized more yeah. than any other people in this country, which is ironic because we're the greatest victims of Americanism, but we're the true most that. Americanized. <laughs> so that's number one. Yeah. We've been Americanized and we have also been de-Africanized. And yeah. so because of that, Black people don't really see any loyalty to Blackness. We fail to recognize that without the Black dollar, there will be no Black power. And religion plays a big role in this too, unfortunately, okay. because religion has stripped us of our cultural identity and replaced it with religious beliefs. And okay. that's why black people are so loyal to their religions because they don't have any culture to be loyal to. So if you talk to the Arabs, right? Uh, Arabs may be loyal as Muslims, but they're Arabs first. Right. You see how that goes. Everybody yeah. is loyal to the ethnicity before the religion, not black people. Slavery stripped the ethnic loyalty and religion helped to keep it away. Wow, yeah, that's powerful. Very powerful. Great points you are making. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, the second point um, I wanted to talk about tonight, you know, with me living here in the Chicagoland area, and as I'm, I know that you're very familiar with the migrant crisis that, um, you know, we're facing here, as well as, you know, in New York and other big cities around the nation where you know the the governments are are placing the migrants in in, in a lot of the black neighborhoods disrupting things and um what i wanted to know is uh with the migrant crisis i want to say with us with with black americans i think it may be the number two most concerning issue for us i think the economy is still number one but with all of America witnessing how the federal government, state government, local governments are in front of all of our faces, making available tens of millions of dollars in funding and resources for the migrants to get on their feet. Whilst, why, uh, why is it, do you believe, um, black people continue to get ignored? Even though we're taxpaying citizens, mm -hmm. why do you believe we continue to be ignored even though we need the same kind of assistance? Because we're the only group in America that doesn't operate collectively in its own best interests. America is a collection of ethnicities. 
This country is only 200 and some odd years old. It's one of the youngest countries in the world, which is right. why everyone here has an ethnicity that goes before their Americanism, Italian American, Chinese American, Latino American, because America, as we all know, is land that was stolen and misappropriated, so forth and so on. So everyone in this country has a history before America. And because of that, they remain loyal to the ethnicity to which they belong, which predates the creation of this country. Everybody except black people. We have no economic identity as a race at all. So for example, as I travel all around the world, I'm noticing that the East Indians are cornering the fast food market and they're yeah. cornering the hotel market. I can't remember the last time I went to a hotel that wasn't owned by an East Indian. You see, so you take a look at Anglo-Saxons and their control of the banking. You look at the Chinese and their control of cheap goods. You know, every race is cornering a market to make sure their people eat. Because if I control all the Dunkin' Donuts, if I control all the Days in, if I control all the restaurants, if I control all the banks or the supermarkets or the automobile industry, my people are guaranteed food to eat, clothing on their back, and a house to sleep in because you can't purchase anything within this industry without coming through us. What are Black people trying to corner? Absolutely nothing. We are the consumers, and we are comfortable being the consumers. We do not produce, and a consumer is the equivalent of a financial slave. A consumer is an equivalent of a financial slave. That's what we are. We are the financial slaves. We are the dependencies of this whole American capitalist economic order. And here's the contradiction about Black people. We want to change our situation, mm -hmm. but we don't want to change our spending behavior. Good point. This is yeah. the contradiction. Yeah. Black people want to be free, but they don't want to put in the work to get there. And one of the first things we have to change if we're going to transform our reality is we have to change the way we spend our money. Yeah. Absolutely. $30 billion on beauty, $2 billion on Air Jordans, $4 billion on liquor, billions of dollars on video games. But when you travel this country, and I'll be in Tulsa, Oklahoma for the Black Wall Street Memorial, May the 25th and 26th. All right. But when you travel this country, you don't see a Black Wall Street operating anywhere, although everybody's always celebrating Black Wall Street. Right. Where right. are they? Yeah. yeah. Show me a black community in America where we own the supermarket to feed the people, hospital to save the people, school to educate the people, bank to invest invest in the people, right. and a manufacturing and distribution sector to employ the people and provide them with the basic needs that we all must have to survive. Where is it? I don't they see don't this kind of black Wall yeah. Street anywhere in America, and that's sad. Because as yeah. you know, we have a very wealthy black bourgeoisie. We have a very wealthy black celebrity and athlete class. Yeah. Still no black Wall Street. Still you not. can go into the richest black communities in America and guess what? They're shopping from white people. They're yep. banking from white people. You see yep. how they, their children yep. are getting their education from white people. Go to the richest black neighborhood in America. Go Absolutely. to Brentwood, Los Angeles, if you want. And guess what? All those rich millionaires and billionaires, whose schools are their children going to? Whose supermarket are they buying their food from? Right. You see how right. this goes. So Absolutely. if you want to change this, we have to change the economic behavior of black people. And that's going to be tough for three reasons. Black people are very selfish. We tend not to care about the best interests of the race. We only care about the best interests of ourselves. That's number one. Number two. Our economic undisciplined behavior, we're not interested in changing it, changing it because black people love to look successful. And one of the best ways we try to make ourselves look successful is by surrounding ourselves with a lot of expensive, useless junk. OK, yeah. why do yeah. why do we buy twice as many Mercedes Benz as, as Caucasians hmm. and we have less than a third of the worth wealth of Caucasians? Hmm. We own twice as many Mercedes as white people. Wow. And we don't Did even have that. one third of their wealth. You know why? Status symbols. Yeah. We are preoccupied with looking like I'm somebody. Hmm. And the sad thing about it 
is we got to have European labels in order to feel like somebody. Yep. And we yep. raise our children this way. That to yeah. be somebody, you got to have Gucci and Louis and mm. Tesla and Mercedes yeah. and Air <laughs> Jordan. And that's the sad because that means the children are also being raised on a diet of conspicuous consumption. So Absolutely. we have to look in the mirror and recognize that we are a big, we're a big reason why we're in a condition that we're in because yeah. we're the only people who refuse. Black people absolutely refuse to weaponize their money. And the church helps us to not become more disciplined by telling us, don't worry about it, just pray and leave it up to Jesus and Muhammad and everything will work itself out in the sweet by and by. Man, you get no argument from me, my brother. <laughs> no argument from me. You you spoke nothing but facts, you know. Um, you know, in 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 regarding, you know, regarding um the immigration um crisis here, the migrant crisis, I, I do want to know from you what position I think uh maybe politically should black Americans have regarding this um this issue. Um we see how they usher these migrants into our neighborhoods and 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 it appears to be a new form of like social engineering that we're seeing. Oh, you know what I mean? It's, so it's, you know, it, what it, it is social be? engineering. It is okay. ethnic cleansing. It is residential genocide. Hmm. When President Biden uh, first announced his candidacy during his candidacy, mm -hmm. or maybe right after he got elected, he said, Right after he got elected, he said he wanted to fast track four to eight million undocumented immigrants to American citizenship. Why was okay. he so concerned about fast tracking illegal immigrants into American citizenship? His first year of office, his first year of office. You know why? He knew he wasn't going to serve the interests of black America. He knew it. Mm -hmm. So in order for the Democratic Party not to take a big hit on election day at the polls. He wanted to fast track all these undocumented and oftentimes anti-African immigrants to citizenship to mm -hmm. reduce the Democratic Party's dependency on the Negro vote this coming mm -hmm. November. That's why Chicago's being flooded. That's why New York City's being flooded. In fact, my brother, I don't think I've been to a black community this year who does not have a migrant issue. It may wow. not be as prominent as New York and Chicago, but everywhere I've right. been, they have a burgeoning population of migrants. And their job is not only to replace you at the voting booth. That's the most immediate need. The right. Democrats need these migrants to be registered to vote. And what's right. ironic about that, most of them are not even citizens. Mm -hmm. But the way in which the policies are written and the way in which election day is so poorly supervised because you know american the american electoral process is a very uh, uh uh what do you call it it has been completely what's the word not fraudulent what's the word i'm looking for um i don't know something I would... is uh ah, i was just on the tip of my tongue well you know uh, I, I i would definitely say it has it's, been it's spoiled not it has been tainted yeah. whatever yeah. the word is yeah, That's American yeah. electoral politics. Votes get thrown out. People's votes don't count. They shut down mm -hmm. the booths early. All kind of fraud. There you go, fraud. The American mm -hmm. electoral process is fraudulent. So you're going to have migrants in Chicago voting in November who are not even citizens. You're going to wow. have the same thing in New York. You're going to have the same thing all around the country. The Democratic Party is counting on these migrants to make up the votes that they know they're going to lose from black people. Mm -hmm. that's what this is about and when it comes down to the republicans i would say that they like to um have the migrants come here because they like the cheap labor oh and absolutely that cheap labor undermines american wages I mean, we see this year after year after year you know and you know i i'm i'm not sure what else can be done um i do know i did a podcast a few months ago dr umar about i don't know if you've ever heard of it but the office of new americans the Office of New Americans is a bill that's bipartisan, bipartisan passed. And basically, it's an, uh, a, a, a system set up to basically walk immigrants through the process, the process of becoming established in America. There are a number of states that are officially on board with the program. And then there are some states that are unofficial, unofficially 
participating in this program. Ironically, Texas, who we see the governor shipping migrants on buses to all these cities and we hear them, you know, fighting, uh, 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 closing the border and everything. But guess what? There is an office of new Americans in El Paso, Texas. A lot of people don't know that, th that it exists. So it's kind of hypocritical when we see, you know, those on the right talk about how do we need to close the borders. They seem to be anti-immigrant, but at the same time, they allow for the office of new Americans to operate within their, you know, within their state. So I'm not surprised by anything you said. I, I am totally in, you know, 100% in agreement with yeah, that. Th th this, this is an ethnic cleansing. And to your point, good brother, as you know, big business runs America. And yeah. so a lot of these Congress persons, they have been sponsored. Their elections have been sponsored by a lot of mega corporations who have been threatening the U.S. government to relocate to second and third world countries where they can get labor for a dollar a day. So mm. part of the agreement between the government and the mega corporation is we will let the migrants sneak in and let you pay them under the table as a ploy to keep the businesses in America. That's what this is about, because mm. big business, the megacorps said, if you can't guarantee me low wages, I'm leaving. I'm not going to be paying minimum wage, uh, FMLA leave, mental health leave, Social Security. I'm not paying that when I can go to Vietnam or I can go, you know, to Cambodia somewhere and have children over there slave for me for a dollar a day. So you're going to have to, you know, make my pot a little sweeter for me to stay in America. So to your point, the Democrats and the Republicans are both on board. But they cannot let the American people know that because white people would lose their minds. You yeah, see that? Buddy. So the oh, propaganda yeah. is we got to act like we don't like it. Let's take Donald Trump with the wall that he was supposed to be building. But guess right. what? That wall that he had built, the 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 uh, migrants and the illegal immigrants, they would just walk around the, the wall, yep. crawl yep. over the wall. There's Same footage. Videos, <laughs> yeah. There's yeah. even videos of Border Patrol helping them cross the wall and come around yeah, it. So, yeah. you know, this, you know, the, the, this illusion of a option, black people, America, black people in particular, because that's our focus. We suffer from this illusion of choice, yeah. you know, as if the Democrats and the Republicans truly represent something different on the migrant issue. They don't. It is all propaganda that's making Americans think they don't want the immigrants in here. If they didn't want them in here, they would not be here. They are That's here right. because they want them. They need them for votes. They need them for poor labor, cheap labor. And most of all, they need them for the American dream. And the American dream is an America without black people. And they're using these migrants to overtake all of the local resources, the homes, the aid, the health care, the homeless shelters, all of the aid that's out there is being monopolized by the migrants while black people are starving on the streets. We have our highest black homelessness population since the Dr. King era. You're talking wow. 56 years. We haven't seen as many black people homeless on the street while they're being overlooked by the mm -hmm. government and the resources that they pay tax dollars for is being given to migrants to do what? Replace them. You know this in Chicago, they passed the law at the top of this year, the end of last year, the governor signed the act into mm -hmm. law where you can be a police officer in Chicago mm -hmm. and not even be a U.S. citizen. They That's passed crazy. another law in Illinois that, you know, made it punishable, criminally criminal punishment, if you deny a migrant the opportunity to rent uh, your apartment or buy a house. So, you know, they can't even they can't even guarantee black people that they right. won't be discriminated against when they rent or buy. And here they are providing these migrants with extra protection, extra help in New York City. I think they're giving out thousand dollar credit cards wow. to the migrants. Now, mind you, this is the same state governments and federal government that said they didn't have enough money to make to improve the schools in the black community. That's they didn't right. have enough money to create jobs. Look at what they're doing for yeah. these people they're doing everything they need and here's the here's the here's the, here's the sad part part of it is our fault yeah. because we have constantly pushed this colorblind multicultural all non-white people are one family rhetoric that mm -hmm. made it very easy 
for them to drop them off in our neighborhood. White people don't talk like that. Right. White people don't, you don't hear white people saying we're all one. No, black no. people was pushing that. So we made it easy because we never weaponized our identity as American Africans. We said, hey, we're for everybody. And yeah. since you're for everybody, you're going to take everybody into your community. But the migrants are not for everybody. The migrants are for themselves. And see, here's another thing that America has done really well these past 20 years, good brother, is they have done a good job of teaching immigrants, all of them, mm -hmm. Asian, Arab, Latin, all of them, they've done a good job letting them know that they do not care about black people. Mm. And if you want to make it in this country, you have to join us in our contempt for blacks. And that's wow. why every group in America treats black people the same way white people do. Because the government trained them and conditioned them to be that way. So we're not just fighting white supremacy anymore. We're yeah. still fighting white supremacy, but we're fighting it in brown face. We're fighting yeah. it in yellow face. We're mm -hmm. fighting it in white face. We're fighting it in red face. So every other group in America is completely united in opposition against the black man and woman. Agreed. Agreed. I, I do have to agree. The anti-black sentiments that we see from all different races. I, and it's strong. I, I it's say, very strong. It right? is. And, and, and it seems it's gotten worse, like in the last, like, four or five years yes man it's, yes. it is it is crazy yeah. ridiculous and wow you know it's it's i'm glad you had brought up uh uh, uh the presidential elections and um i want to ask you this with the upcoming presidential elections upon us i've always viewed our electorate as a captured vote between the two political parties right democrats they always practice benign neglect and the Republicans, they tend to practice the overt racism by embracing the extremists, you know, like in the MAGA crowd, you know. Well, given the current sociopolitical and economic position Black Americans are in today, which administration, the Biden or the Trump administration and or political party, do you believe would be best for us as a people to be able to facilitate the black economy we we desire to have. I want to step back and say this. Black people have a very dysfunctional way of approaching electoral politics. Okay. We vote for people based on how we personally feel about them, not based on their policy. Right. In other words, we engage politicians the same way we engage pastors and reverends on Sunday morning at the church. Hmm. How does grandma choose her church based on how she feels yeah. personally about the pastor, how sure. he preaches, how he can move me, how he yeah. delivers the word? And as you know, in church, the only thing the pastor has to do to be considered a good pastor is to be a good talker. Hmm. And yeah. so church culture has spilled over into political culture. Yeah. So yeah. we select our politicians the same way we select our pastors. We don't do no research on them. We don't study them. We don't ask them any questions. We don't see what they're doing for the community. All you care about on Sunday is whether or not this pastor can entertain me. If he can entertain me, this is my church. I don't care what he's doing with the collection money. I don't care what he's doing for the kids. I don't care what he's doing for the community. If he has the gift of oratory, he will be my pastor. Yeah. yeah. We do the exact same thing in politics. We vote for the people who sound the best, and we vote for the people who we personally like. Why is that dysfunctional? The main reason why that's dysfunctional, my brother, is politics is business. It ain't about personal feeling. That's right. Just like that's you right. might go into business with somebody you don't even like. But mm -hmm. guess what? If y'all have the same goals, y'all will agree to disagree and work together to make that money together. That's you right. don't have to like somebody to go into business with them. And at the same time, just because you like somebody doesn't mean you should go into business with them. I'm sure there's people you like a whole lot. You would mm. never go into business with them. Not personally, <laughs> personally, yeah, you right. love them. That's right. Professionally, ain't no way in hell. Can't do it. Can't do it.
Absolutely. That's the mistake black people make. We voted for Barack Obama based on how he sounded. We mm -hmm. voted for Bill Clinton based on how he sounded. We mm -hmm. voted for Joe Biden based on how he sounded. We voted for Jimmy Carter based on how he sounded. We voted for Kennedy based on how he sounded. Mm -hmm. Why are we choosing politicians based on how we feel about them personally? We should be looking at policy. First of all, who financing your campaign? Because if I know who financing your campaign, I know who controls you. Yep. We don't know even look at you that. need to know. <laughs> we don't even yep. look at that. I yeah. knew Barack Obama was a sellout, not because I was a psychic, but mm -hmm. I looked at who financed Barack Obama and I said, there's no way in hell he could be financed by all these Wall Street companies and give a damn about black people in America or anywhere else. So I mm -hmm. knew because no politician has ever turned his back on the funders of his campaign. Never in American history, you can't name a president, a governor, a mayor, a congressperson who has ever turned their back on the people who funded their campaign. So if you know who's funding them, you know whose agenda they're gonna to dance to once they get elected. That's number one. Number two, we don't force them to have a conversation with us about our vote. I remember when they asked Barack Obama when he was campaigning. I can't remember. It was the first term or the second. They said, President Obama or presidential hopeful Obama, you spend almost no time in the black community campaigning. Guess what Barack Obama said? He What's said, that? I don't have to. They're going to vote for me anyway. Hmm. He said that in an interview. Barack Obama yeah. said, "Wow, I don't need to campaign in the black community because I already have their vote. You yeah. see that? And yeah. what did you hear so many black people say? I voted for him just because he was black. He was black, yeah. Absolutely. I voted for him just because he was black. Insane. And what did I say? If you look at any of my videos before Barack Obama got elected, I said black people are going to be worse off when he's out of office. Why? Because we sat still for eight years, my brother. Mm -hmm. We sat still for eight years, let Barack Obama cater to every so-called minority group in America. He catered to Latinos. He catered to immigrants. He catered to the homosexuals, the feminists. Barack Obama catered to everybody and completely ignored Black people. Even ignored the police killings. Didn't do anything about the wave of police killings that took off during his prayer. He did nothing. And what did Black people do? Sit there and worship him the entire time. So once right. Donald Trump got in office, Donald Trump said, oh, I can do whatever I want. Because yeah, if Barack did. Obama ain't got to be accountable to black people, I know I don't. Why do you think Joe Biden ignored us? You yeah. know why? Because we established a precedent with Barack Obama. He's the first yeah. president in American history. Black people never criticized publicly. Did you know that? No, I did not. There's did no not. other president. Wow. There's no other president in American history that black people did not criticize publicly. Barack Obama is the first one. And by us not holding him accountable, we made it easy for Donald Trump to ignore us. By us not holding Barack Obama accountable, we made Joe Biden. Look, think about it. Joe Biden was the man's vice president for eight years. Yes, he was. He saw firsthand Barack Obama was not held accountable by black folks. That's at true. all. At all. Even though we were doing worse under Obama in every category. Jobs education, incarceration, the numbers went up because white people had to remind us that they were still in charge. So the mm -hmm. racism intensified. And right. guess what? We still made Obama do nothing. When he went into the public schools and tried to transgenderize the public schools, we still didn't say nothing. So Joe mm -hmm. Biden says, when I get elected, I don't have to do anything. And that's exactly what he did. And guess what? If he gets elected again, he ain't going to do anything. And now no, that they got no, all the I migrants agree. getting ready to vote, now they got all the migrants getting ready to vote, the Democratic Party is gambling, and we don't know the outcome. Right. But they're gambling that they might have enough migrants illegally registered to vote to counteract the absentee black vote on election day. I wouldn't doubt it. I wouldn't doubt it. Oh, my goodness, man. This is you know, our fault, brother. This is yeah. it, as much as I blame racism. I blame black impotence. Yeah. We yeah. hate each other more than we hate the oppression we suffer from. Mm -hmm. Black yeah. people don't have a problem with white people being in charge. They just don't want to see no black people in charge. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, we do have to hold ourselves a lot more accountable for a lot of the pitfalls we found ourselves in. A lot yes, of the uh, 
a lot of the negative um um, um situations we find ourselves in absolutely i agree with you 100 percent um but i do want to i do want to know from you you know is there any hope <laughs> you know given, yes there is all right there's you know, a lot given, of hope right you know problem. what's up what's up the words that we need to describe mm -hmm. the things black people are going to have to do in order for us to resurrect ourselves mm -hmm. are not popular words in the black community because we haven't used them for more than a half of a century. All right. Words like sacrifice. Sacrifice, yeah. Words like organization. Organization. Words like financial responsibility. Absolutely. Black people don't like to hear them kind of words. See, the reason we don't have a lot of institutions, my brother, because institutions require sacrifice, yep. financial responsibility, yep. a lot of work. Black people, look at me with the FDMG Academy, my brother, 10 years. Yeah. 10 years, five years to find the school, five years to renovate the school. It takes work. Yeah. And the only reason why I'm still at it is because I'm committed, our boys, need this school institutions are not easy especially when you're not taking on non-black money as i'm mm. doing you see yes. so black people don't want no part of that build an institution it's going to take a couple of years and i'm not getting nothing out of this in the meantime except to know that i'm helping my people understand something my brother we're living at a time where the young adults of today they are the grandchildren of the 80s and the 90s right you see the crack era right not that their grandparents was on crack but the crack era destroyed the community unity that we had yes it did crack it did. you know we talk about the chemical devastation and the incarceration devastation but what about the psychological devastation of crack once people started selling dope once people started sniffing dope you no longer could know who you could trust it became every family for themselves, every man for themselves, every woman for themselves. We became individuals. Mm -hmm. And we haven't gotten over the individualism that the crack epidemic created in Black America. The solution is the community, my brother. That's the solution. But how many Black people are honestly ready to say, I'm willing to do whatever? I'm willing to give up 25% of my disposable income to save Black America. There's not many of us willing to do that. Most of us are psychologically defeated my brother yeah most yeah. blacks in america are psychologically defeated we don't believe it's possible to overcome white supremacy we have no hope in ourselves to overcome which is interesting because we all claim to be religious and spiritual right well if you claim to be religious and spiritual how can you have no hope in god's first people which in my opinion are god's chosen people the black man and woman if you don't have no faith in yourself, if you have no faith in us, you have no faith in God either. Good point. Good point. We yeah, can fix this me, problem, I... my brother. We can yeah. fix it. But as the late great grandmaster teacher, Pan-Africanist and scholar warrior, Dr. John Henry Clark said, he said, we're going to need a sacrificial generation. Mm -hmm. He said, we're going to need one gen a 20 year period where okay. every, Amer every American African does what is necessary in order to free ourselves politically and economically. I'm going to be honest with you, my brother, and you know this because you work with our people as much as I do. A lot of us really don't care. Yeah, we really don't care. Right. Black people believe they can make it without the group. Yeah, That is the curse. We're the yeah. only people who believe I can make it without the group. You see that? So I'm going to gamble. Yeah, they killed Trayvon. The police mm -hmm. killed Brianna. They killed Sandra Bland. They killed Tamir Rice. They killed Eric Garner. They killed Philando Castile. They killed Amir Pope. But I'm going to gamble that none of my kids get hit by white supremacy. You see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah we this do that. This black family is homeless. This black family is homeless. This black family is homeless. But I'm going to gamble that my family won't be. That black man got laid off right before he hit retirement. She got laid off right before she hit retirement. But I'm a gamble that it don't happen to me. Black people are playing the lottery. They're playing the political lottery of America, and they are gambling that out of all the 50 million Africans in America, I will be the one that escapes the trap of racism. And guess what? 
that's all fine and well and well until it isn't right <laughs> yeah yeah. And the minute racism mm -hmm. traps your ass up, now you want to become Mr. Black. Now you mm -hmm. want to become Mr. Activist. You see that? Yeah. I yeah, mean, think yeah. about the celebrities you know, what I'll call it, no names. Mm -hmm. Think about the celebrities and athletes you know who didn't give a damn about what was happening in Black America mm -hmm. until they fell from grace. Mm -hmm. And when they fell from grace, all of a sudden they became politically conscious. Oh yeah, they all run back to the community. They knew what it was like to be black, but we oh, didn't yeah. hear none of that when you was getting it. Right, and that's the problem with us. We right. are easily, easily uh, swayed away from loyalty to the community. Yeah, everybody knows if black people make enough money, they will turn their back on their people with no hesitation. Sad. Most people that's know sad. that. Yeah. The white man says every Negro has a price. Mm. We are easily swayed. You know why we got more house Negroes than any other group? We got more house Negroes than any other group. And not only do we have more house Negroes than any other group, we have the most well-educated and well-placed house Negroes. <laughs> Normally the traitors are the vagabonds of other okay. communities. They're the people at the bottom, not in black America. Our mm. traders are people at the top. At the top, you, yeah. You know why we got more <laughs> traders than other groups? Because we have more hopelessness than other groups. Mm. We have more self-hate than other groups. We have a lower estimation of our collective ability to solve our problem than any other group. And wow. whenever people are hopeless, whenever people are psychologically defeated, whenever people don't have any faith in each other, they can easily be manipulated into selling out their own people. Yeah, yeah. Damn, the average black lot. child is a sellout waiting to happen. They were raised by black parents on materialism, worship of white people, and they've been told their whole life to go to college, get a good job, and get away from black people. That is the message from 90% of black parents to their children. Wow, wow, amazing. Very powerful, very humbling. You know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I do hope you are listening closely <laughs> to the words coming from uh, Dr. Umar Johnson tonight. Um, we as a people, my brother, we do have a lot to work on. We have a lot to be desired. And um, I, I do agree with you. The only answer for us is us. Is us. Yeah. Nobody's coming to you know? help you. And let me say this to that point, my brother, because I'm glad you brought that up. You know, there's a lot of talk and conversation about reparations. Yes. And I believe in reparations. I support reparations. It was we, the Pan-Africanists, who gave birth to the reparations movement. This isn't something that popped up on YouTube over the past three years. This right. thing goes all the way back to the 1700s and yes, even before that. Yes, it does. My problem with reparations, like every other problem we have in Black America, we're using it as a scapegoat not to take responsibility for where we are and what we have. Okay. I haven't heard anybody yet talk about until we get reparations. What are we going to do about the $2 trillion we waste every year in this country? While we're waiting on reparations, what are we going to do about all the money black women spend on hair care? What are we going to do about all the money black men spend on clothing and sneakers and jewelry? So you mean to tell me we're walking around like reparations is going to solve black America's problem without a transformation in consciousness? Do we not understand that internal reparations precedes external reparations? Do you realize half the problems we have, core problems, money cannot solve them? Absolutely. Money will not solve the black male female relationship crisis. Money will not solve the snow bunny crisis. Money will not solve the self hatred. Money yeah. will not solve the mistrust. Money will not help us value the black woman any more than we do. Half the problems we got are psychological and must mm. be solved in the community and in the mind, and they do not come with a dollar amount. But you have Negroes trying to reduce Black America's problems to reparations. If you don't spend your money wisely now, mm -hmm. 
What makes you think you're going to spend the rep? We don't spend our tax return wise wise. We didn't spend the PPP loans wisely. We don't mm -hmm. spend our annual income wisely, but we're going to spend reparations wisely. Mm -hmm. To me, that is dishonest thinking right there. And a lot of black people are engaging in this reparations will solve our problems narrative. I completely disagree with it. I stand for reparations because we are entitled to it for what our ancestors went through. Mm -hmm. It's spiritual. Right. But at the same time, I'm telling you, good brother, if we don't learn how to leverage the revenue we already got, if we can't leverage two trillion. If you can't handle what you already got responsibly, what makes you think you're going to do anything better with the reparations? If we don't fix the problems we have before we get reparations, reparations would only make those problems worse. I agree. I agree with agree with you 100 percent. But I want to I, I do want to elaborate on something from my learning about the reparations movement. Thank God reparations isn't just about cash reparations it packages not it's not the reparations packages that I've, I've been looking at i've been researching from all the different organizations that are truly involved i'm not talking about the fly by nights or yes, anything sir. like yes, that sir. yes sir I have inside of those um, um 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 financial literacy you know programs um that they um have a part of the package um they also have our mental health you know being addressed it's part of reparations packaging because uh, all all of the issues that you just described that we we have that's a part of reparations too because money can't possibly it can't possibly solve everything and just like you said unless we address and worthless those issues money, by the way let us not forget and worthless correct. money Could, yeah, that's right that's right but and, and and so yeah unless we are able to tackle some of the inner issues that we as a community have receiving any money like you said it'll just go out the window it'll we'll be handing it right back you know to uh to white america we won't use it to advance it'll ourselves go right it'll go yeah, right back. It, it'll be useless to us so fortunately and 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 i don't know if i get a chance to i would love to speak to you more about the different reparations packages mm -hmm. that are currently out there because i felt like you in the beginning you know if it's just about cash we can't do that but fortunately those who are in the reparations movement, they recognize that as well. Yeah, they recognize that, and they as still well, need so. to do better, though. Oh yeah, because, oh yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm still not content with what I'm <laughs> right. saying. Yeah, yeah. You you know, I'm still not content because a lot of the things that are being asked for outside of money, mm -hmm. if we took care of the wealth that we mm -hmm. should be demanding, control of the land and the resources. We won't need the system to give us those things. We can create those for ourselves. Financial literacy, that don't need to be on my reparations list. Right. Because we have enough people in our community that can do that. Mental health, there's not a damn thing a white psychologist is going to do to help black people. So that right. don't need to be on my, you understand? So Right. Again, it'll, be, uh, it'll be our people working absolutely. with our people. That's what absolutely. it is. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I just think that two criticisms of the reparations. Okay. A lot of the people involved are not visionary enough. Okay, yeah. And there are now, you understand me? Yeah, yeah. I think too many people are looking at how this can benefit them in their lifetime. Yeah. Or yeah. how this can benefit their generation. For me, mm -hmm. reparations is for the race. Yes. Every, yes. You know what that means? All those who have mm -hmm. transitioned, mm -hmm. all those who have not yet been born. Mm -hmm. I have heard no conversation from any of the reparations fronts okay. on what are we going to put in trust mm -hmm. to the next 50 generations of American children, American African children born in it. I ain't heard nothing about that. Oh, okay. what are we going to set up for posterity? You follow me, my right, brother? Right, yeah, for yes. Unborn. Right, right. Well, you know, the, the current reparations packages, they are multi generational, they are not set up or even considered to be just a one payment one type of one stop shop thing no not at all the everything you just mentioned those the current reparation packages are multi generational they I they, need to see some cuz I, I, I see nothing i was I, I see nothing i was content with yet nothing yeah I, what i would like to do what i would like to do if if i get an opportunity 
um, I would like to get your email. I want to yes, email sir. you some information that I have. Um, I'm okay. not sure if you've had a chance to read um, From Here to Equality by Dr. Sandy Darity. He has the blueprint. Everything that you mentioned, every issue that you brought up, it is thoroughly addressed. Glad to hear that. Book. Glad to hear and, that. And it's beautiful. It's a great read. Um, you get a chance again from here to equality by, by Dr. William um, Sandy Darity. Oh, you got to read that. You got to read that because you're right, man. Everything that you said, I, I cannot dispute. And every concern that you brought up, it is definitely addressed, not only in, in his um, um, reparations packages, but a couple of other economists that I'm familiar with love to, um, you know, slide it your way so you can read right. it over and you can see it for yourself because for sure. I'm, I'm for with sure. you. If, if it's just about cash, no, it won't do us any good because our issues are multi-layered. And so our yes, solution indeed. Yes, indeed. are going to be multi-layered. So Absolutely. I'm on board with you. I'm on board and, with you. And to that point too, not to belabor it too much, I think in the black community when it comes time to discuss solutions, we have a dictatorship by college degree. Hmm. There is yeah. always this yeah. assumption that those with college degrees are somehow more intelligent and better thinkers than the people who are not. The yeah. only thing the college degree has given you or us, those of us who have them, hmm. and I got six of them. Only the got only one. The <laughs> only advantage it gives us is more knowledge. Yeah. A college degree does not suggest more intelligence. Nope. A college degree does not suggest that you are a better thinker. And I'm bringing this up because the W.E.B. Du Bois curse of the talented 10th hmm. is still with us as a people. Even with reparations, I'm noticing that a lot of your upper class, middle class Negroes mm -hmm. tend to be the ones putting forth the narrative without a conversation yeah. for brothers and sisters on the ground. Right, right. I, I'll give you another analysis to this. You know, when we have conversations about plural marriage in the black community, right? Mm -hmm. Men with more than one wife. Right. Whenever there's a conversation by the sisters, mm -hmm. a lot of times it's your middle class, upper middle class, entrepreneurial class, black women controlling the narrative. Hmm. You never hear from poor black women. You yeah. never hear from homeless yeah. black women. You yeah. never hear from black women with more than four or five children. You never hear from black women who would not necessarily be a brother's first or second choice. Right. They're never included in the conversation about plural marriage. So just to draw a comparison, yeah. getting back to the reparations, the people on the ground are almost never consulted about things that affect them the most. I deal with this in the schools, right? Right. You mm -hmm. have a kid. They're trying to find out what can we do to stop this kid from getting in so much trouble. So you got the principal, you got the vice principal, you got the dean of students, you got the teacher, you got the grade leader, you got the math coach, the psychologist, the social worker. And for two hours, nobody bothered to ask the child or their parents, hmm. what do y'all think we need to do for this young man to be more successful in this school? My point is, if it's only people who consider themselves to be an expert in anything, not just reparations, anything. Right. Right. It's just like with mass incarceration. Half the people discussing solutions for the ex-offenders, returning citizens, have never been a returning citizen and never bothered to ask them what is it that they need. And I'm going to tell you why. Great point. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why, my brother. One of our greatest contradictions as American Africans. We are often led by and our policy is set by those who are the least interested in our success. Hmm. From hmm. the pastor to the politician, to the business owner, to the school principal, to the black business owner, most of those who are involved in so-called solutions for the American African people don't live in our neighborhood, don't right. live with us, consider themselves to be better than us and have a nerve to be put in charge. 
of yeah. how to solve our problem. We must cut the black bourgeoisie dictatorship in half. It is a cancer. The reason why black America's problems are not getting better is we keep on choosing bougie, comfortable, European-loving, self-hating coons to do the fighting. We just talked about election, right? Let's go to the Congressional mm. Black Caucus. Mm -hmm. Why haven't we heard a damn thing from the Congressional Black Caucus? Right. Now, these are your 60 or so Black congresspersons representing Black people from all over the country. Right. You got three senators in there, right? Raphael Warnock, Tim Coon Scott, and the, <laughs> and the brother from Jersey. I'm forgetting his name. Okay. Yeah. And But these are your big wigs. I don't hear no pressure being put on the Democrats. Mm -hmm. I don't hear no pressure being put on the Republicans. Do you know what the Congressional Black Caucus is doing right now? They're getting ready to come to Chicago in Black August for the Democratic National Convention. National Convention, yeah. And they're going to try to convince Black Chicago mm -hmm. catching hell being replaced by migrants. Right. They're going to come there and convince y'all to vote for Joe Biden anyway. And when you say why, guess what they're going to say? They're not going to say because he's going to make the schools better. They're not mm. going to say because he's going to change the criminal code. They're not going to say because he's going to fix gentrification and homelessness. They're not going to say because he's going to stop police brutality or the migrant crisis. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we don't have another uh, Daquan McDonald. They're not right. going to say that. You know what they're going to say? Because Donald Trump would be worse off. Worse, you would yeah. be worse off <laughs> with yep. Donald Trump. That's what they're going to tell you. Yeah, absolutely. You That's what they're saying. worse off with Donald Trump yeah. than Joe Biden. That yeah. is the Democratic, excuse me, Playbook. That's just... <laughs> Black Caucus. That's their line. Why yeah. should Black people vote? Because yeah. you'll be better off with Joe Biden than Donald Trump. That's not why Chinese people are voting. They're voting because they're getting concessions and resources. Jews yep. are voting because they're getting concessions and resources. Latinos and Arabs are voting because they're getting concessions and resources. Homosexuals and feminists are voting because they're getting concessions and resources. Why are Black people voting? Because I'm better off being oppressed by Joe Biden than being oppressed by Donald Trump. And that's why we're never going to get nothing. Because we need we need a coup. Black yeah. America needs a coup. It doesn't have to be violent. Right. But we need a coup. And what I mean by coup, we need to overthrow the black bourgeoisie dictatorship on the black agenda and black leadership. Until yeah. black America has a coup and overthrows the black bourgeoisie's dictatorship on black leadership and the black agenda will never be free because your leaders are fighting for your enemies. Yeah, yeah, this gatekeeper culture that we have, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's destroying us. It absolutely is. Look, uh, well, look, Dr. Umar, I don't want to stay too long, but man, yes, I, sir, yes, man, sir. I let me throw early. my number out there for your listening. Please audience. do, please Everybody do, please do. Me. Uh, 215 989 9858. Again, that's 215 989 Uh, they can email me through my website, drumarjohnson.com, Facebook, uh, Instagram. Well, excuse me, Instagram and Twitter at Dr. Umar Johnson, Facebook. Uh, Dr. Umar Ifad Tunde, uh, Wednesday, the day after tomorrow, I'll be speaking at HBCU Coppin State in Baltimore. And then I'll be coming okay. on down to New Orleans to celebrate my sister, our sister, the Shantia's Black Business Launch of the Shantia's oh. Dimensions uh, Consulting Firm. We're looking forward to being in her company Saturday night in Gretna, Louisiana, Club Caesars, 209 Monroe Street. Looking forward to being with my Big Easy family. Then I'll be at FAMU, Florida A&M University, for their Black Psychology Conference. I'll be keynoting that on Monday, March the 25th, and I'll be staying the whole week. Then I'm off to Memphis for the Dr. King 56th anniversary memorial, excuse me, of Dr. King's assassination. I'll be in right. Memphis to keynote that. Then I'll be in Huntsville, Alabama on April the 7th, and then we're going to have our protest in Boonell, Florida for the young brother, ben, Brendan Depper. I don't know if you heard about him, the brother who beat up the white teacher's assistant in Palm Coast oh, Florida yeah, High yeah. School. Right, he could right. do 30 years in jail, my brother. Yeah, he could I heard do 30 about years that. in jail. No knife, no gun. Yeah. She's still yeah. alive. He can go to jail for 30 years. So if anybody wants to come and stand with Dr. Umar in solidarity outside of the Kim C. Hammond Justice Center in Boonell, Florida, we will be down there on May the 1st to let that black young man know that we care about him.
and it's just the same. That whole case is almost like an Emmett Till case, the way that they railroaded that brother. He got all kind of mental health issues. The white family that raised him didn't take proper care of him. And so if anybody wants to come, and I hope my Florida family come, but I hope we all come because we should all care about our black children because this right here is one of the most egregious examples of how the school to prison uh, pipeline operates. Uh, but New, New Orleans, I can't wait to come, can't wait to get there. Love talking to the people. Again, if anybody needs to reach me, especially about your children, autism, ADHD, learning disabilities, speech and language impairments, IQ, IEP, psychological evaluation, any way I could be of assistance to you, you can text message me 215-989-9858. All right, all right. Well, Dr. Umar, thank you again for joining us here on the Reset Talk Show. It's been a pleasure. And um, we'll be in touch with you, man, because I want to talk to you more about reparations, my brother. And let me give you... uh, I don't know if you took that email address. Uh, Please give it to us. D-R-U-M-A-R Johnson. Dr. Umar Johnson. No period after doctor. No period uh, after Dr. doctor. Dr. Umar Johnson at yahoo.com. One word. Okay. Very good. Very good. All yeah. right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. And uh, keep hope alive, if you will. Build black. Be black. One love. All right, my brother. Be blessed. You as well, my brother. Up right now. I'm not going to